Sons of life are raging, stand by me. You can clap, it won't offend me. <clears throat> I can tell you, they sang it for the Lord. That's what's important. And probably because their dad wanted them to, but if they did everything their dad wanted them to, they'd be up here and I'd be down there. They could sing and I'd listen. You know, one of my favorite thoughts in that, in that song that they sang, the one who's never lost a battle, Stand by me. He's never lost a fight. He's never not won. You say, well, but he, he, he died and on the cross and they buried him. Yeah, but he rose again. He didn't lose a battle. He won. See, just when Satan thought he had defeated him, he goes, uh-huh. All things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are called according to his purpose, and I win again, Satan. Satan thinks he's winning right now. By the looks of the world today, you might think he is too. Just remember, the Lord is standing by and standing by us. He'll never leave us nor forsake us. One of these days, he's going to show his face again. And Satan will flee. Along with the rest of the world. Romans chapter number 5, this passage behind me uh, on the screen is what I'll be uh, addressing this morning, as I said I was going to, and um, <clears throat> I, um, I don't mind telling you there are times that I struggle with what exactly the Lord would have me to preach for you, because it isn't about what I want to preach, if it was, that would probably but really, I, I spent my time asking, Lord, what do your people need to hear? What, what, not only that, if you're here as a visitor this morning, I prayed, God, help me to help the visitors this morning. Give me something that they can take home. Give me something that they can get a hold of. Give me something that will help them. Uh, and I pray that way.
message, if the ears aren't open, if the heart's not receptive, they won't get it either. So we need him to do a work in our hearts, in our ears, to open our hearts and our understanding, to open our ears so that we might listen and, uh, and, and receive what he has for us. And I'm confident if you came to hear from God, you will. Uh, I'm also confident if you came wondering what this Babylon would say, I'll babble on for you. You'll probably get what you're expecting. But if you're looking for and you're expecting something from God, I know that in this passage and in this thought, you can find something that will be a help to you. Let's say our verse one more time. It's right there on the screen. When we stand to do that. You can kind of stretch a little bit, move around. Let's say this together, and you'll be able to say it nice and loud because your diaphragm's open, and you can really say it nice and loud for everybody on YouTube. Ready? Romans 5, 10, and 11. For if we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his Son. Much more, being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. And not only so, but we also joy in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom we have now received the atonement. A lot, a lot of good thoughts in this passage. I like that last verse, or that last phrase there. It says, by whom we have now received. That's a past tense, isn't it? The atonement. We'll talk about that word atonement. Um, we have joy in God through our Lord Jesus Christ. By the way, a lot of people looking for it in a lot of the wrong places, and they get, they get a little joy, or what they call joy, but it's temporary. Uh, it's just a buzz off the world, and it'll soon pass away and leave you with a headache. A little spiritual application. name. Amen and amen. <clears throat> Have you ever had a problem? Relationship problem? Listen, there is no problem like a relationship problem. <laughs> Those are more of a problem than anything else I've ever run into in my whole life. Listen, if I've got a car problem, I can fix it or junk it, right? If I've got an animal problem of whatever sort, we can work that out, right? Because it's not going to argue with me. <laughs> but what people problems are a problem indeed. You ever felt like no one loved you? You were all alone? Nobody cared? And if you weren't around tomorrow, it would not matter. Frightened because of the thought that nobody cares. If I wasn't here, nobody would know otherwise. And nobody would even probably come look. I've gotten quite that low. But I have. I want to mix my testimony into the story this morning, into the, into the message, my, uh, my, some of my history. Um, I've told parts of it, and I, I certainly am not going to tell all of my testimony this morning, just relevant parts to what I'm sharing with you and from this passage, and we'll get to that in a moment, but I want to preface it with, with the part of this story. <clears throat> Have you ever had one of those relationship problems that's been resolved? I mean fixed. I mean it is in the past. I mean you, you had a problem to the point of, of no hope, and then all of a sudden 
you, it got turned around and there was reconciliation. That is, it got repaired. It got fixed. There were hugs. Maybe there were kisses. Maybe, maybe there, there was restored friendship, restored joy. Everything was good in the world again. I have. I have. Young people, when I was a, a young person, when I was a young person, 16 years old, I went through a time with my folks where I couldn't bear to get along with them anymore. Now, it was prob- most of it was probably just normal challenges of young adult versus parent and things that just did not get worked out well. The communication wasn't there. I can point back to a number of problems. And, and uh, probably today um, at least give some thought as to how they could have been rectified differently. But I figured out my solution when I was 16. I left home. I didn't tell my parents I was leaving. I wrote a note. I left it where they would find it. I took everything that I thought I owned. I went and got my 22 and my 20 gauge. I went and got, I took my bed out of my room. I, I took my dresser. I took all my clothes. I took my fishing pole and my tackle box. I mean, I took everything that I felt like was mine. I had it figured out that because of how our relationship had been going, they didn't really care about me, understand me. From what I could see, they loved my brothers more than they loved me, and I was just a problem for them. And so, problem solved, I'll leave, you can go on. I'll figure it out alone. I had friends. One of my friends said, Jim, I, I'm sorry it's not going. So I have a wonderful relationship with my parents, and they said you can stay at my house. And you're okay. You got a spare bedroom. And so it's, you know, you're welcome to it. One day I loaded all my belongings into the bed of my You know, I really thought it was going to be easier than that. You say, what part? All of it. I had friends. You say, well, you had friends. You didn't feel alone. No, I felt very alone, especially as I drove away that day. My brothers and I fought, especially my my middle brother and I fought like cats and dogs don't fight like this, okay? We fought. I've never felt... But I really thought this was the solution, just to get away. But I was scared, lonely, and no one 
No one, not even my friends, not my, the parents of my friends, could comfort me. My, my friend and his parents did get along well. But I soon realized that in that home there were issues too, and I soon figured out why. Trouble came. Now, I'll spare you a lot of those gruesome details this morning, but I will tell you this. Through some encouragement, through some counseling, and through the willingness of my parents, I made reconciliation with them. And by the end of the school year, I moved back home. Our relationship for the next while was as sweet as it had ever been. And for the most part, it stayed that way until my daddy went home to be with the Lord. This word that we're looking at this morning, or this passage that we're looking at with these words in it, I want to relate those words for you and help you to understand. So let me point them out real quick. You see this verse uh, 11 uh, and this last word, atonement. That's a big word. Understand this, that that word atonement comes out of the same word. It is it, its root word, if you will, the word that it comes from is found in verse 10, twice. We were reconciled to God, much more being reconciled. Those words are associated because reconciled is the root of atonement. Atonement is the result of reconciliation. They are together. They're meaning a very, very similar thing. Okay? When we come to the place where we've been reconciled to God, then according to verse 11, we experience joy. We also joy in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom we have now received, it's been accomplished, atonement, <clears throat> The reconciliation is complete. The Greek word for reconcile means to change. To change. We have been, we were reconciled to God. We were changed to God. <coughs> by the death of His Son, much more being changed, being reconciled, we shall be saved by His life. There is a change that's talked about in verse number 10. while the Greek word for atonement means exchange. Reconciled, its Greek word means to change, while atonement means exchanged. I was changed by the exchange. And when I was changed and the exchange was complete, I had joy in God, and it came through our Lord Jesus Christ because He's the one that brought about the change in my life. <laughs> and since, as verse 10 tells us, we were enemies, <clears throat> because of our sin, we needed some change. We must have some change. And since we could not make these changes on our own, because I tried, God sent His Son into the world to help me by making the exchange with me. 
Jesus came to do an exchange. What did he exchange? His righteousness for my unrighteousness. His holiness for my unholiness. <clears throat> his life for my life. And his death for my death. See, the wages of sin is death. We know this. That means separation from God. We are broken. Our relationship with God is broken the same way every relationship gets broken. Something comes between you. With me and my parents. I could go back and I could probably relay a, a number of things at least that happened in our relationship that set me at odds with them, them at odds with me, and I could say those were the things that separated us. By the way, we can do the same thing with God. We can look and understand what has separated us. It's our sin. We lied, we cheated, we stole, we, you name it. We disobeyed our parents. All those things that the Ten Commandments and all the rest of the Scriptures identify for us. We have a problem. We are separated from God because of our sin. We know that. And Jesus came because we couldn't fix it. And because of that change, once that exchange has happened, we can have joy. But that joy can only come through Jesus Christ. If you're looking for joy outside of the change that results in the exchange, you will not be satisfied, you will not be happy, you will not accomplish your goal. Um, <clears throat> I know because I tried. The joy that I found when I accepted the Lord Jesus Christ as my Savior was likened unto, but far greater than, the joy I found driving back down that country road with all my belongings in the bed of my truck on the way to my parents' home. Just to help you understand and put it in your mind, I loaded my possessions and left my parents' home with fear, with trembling, with, with, with animosity and with hatred and bitterness and resentment. And you, just a whole bunch of things were there along with the fear. But the day that I loaded my stuff up and I headed back to, there was joy, there was love, because I knew, I had already known, I had already spoken with, we had already worked through a lot of the difficulties. And my parents looked me in the eye and said, Son, we love you. Would you please come? In the same way, but so much grander way, so much larger way, when I accepted the Lord Jesus Christ as my Savior, was that joy settled into my heart? Was that peace that passes all understanding that, 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 that I really can't explain other than to say, all is well in the world? <clears throat> when I accepted Christ as my Savior, I knew that I had a home. A home where I would be loved and received and accepted and never be separated from, never be kicked out of, any of that. You're in Romans, I believe, if you've turned with me in your Bible. Maybe you're just looking at the screen behind me. But look at Romans chapter 8 with me. And I want to point out a few verses as we go through this that I hope and trust will help you this morning. By the way, I had a problem with my parents. I've had other problems throughout the ages. I've been married for, uh, for 35 years, and guess what? There's been a few hiccups in that relationship, <clears throat> and I'll take the full credit for that. But I'll just say this, the joy of reconciliation, the joy of that change 
that ends in an exchange. There's nothing like it. And if you have a broken relationship, a broken relationship right now, understand that there is hope, but the first thing you have to do is realize that we're going to have to change and have an exchange. Once we do that, we can get to change. Understand that if there's a gap, there's a separation between you and God. If that relationship is dead, there can be the change. Result in joy, and that's what this verse is talking about. Romans chapter 8, verse 35, if you found your spot there, notice it says, Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword? As it is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, and all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able, shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Now here's the challenge with human relationships. You can break them, restore them, and break them. <clears throat> we're sensitive like that. The relationship with God through salvation, the relationship that Jesus is talking about here and that Jesus restores here, that one gets restored and it stays restored permanently if it truly, in fact, was restored. Because I received the atonement. Not that we can't have some hiccups, not that we have some difficulties, not that we can't get in trouble. We'll talk, we'll talk about that in a moment. But the point is, I've been adopted. In order to fully understand and appreciate this, and why there's joy there, and what that's all about, we need to understand something. Why are you here? I'm not talking about here this morning. I'm talking about here in existence. Why are you alive in the first place? Remember one of the challenges that I said I faced? Nobody loves me. Nobody cares about me. If I wasn't here tomorrow, no one would even care. Now, by the way, that's a lie. You find yourself that way. Tell yourself that is a lie. That's not true. First of all, God loves me. Second of all, there are others who love me, and, and we may not see that. We may not fully understand that or appreciate that right now, but it's true. But why are we here? God has a reason for you, and I've said that a number of times. But look with me at uh, Colossians chapter 1, verse 16. Turn to the right. If you're in Romans, uh, you might want to hang, hang a finger or something in uh, Romans because no doubt we'll be back. That's our text for the day. Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, Colossians chapter 1. And I want to relate the whole counsel of God's Word the best I can this morning in the time that we have. Colossians chapter 1, verse number 16. The Bible says, For by Him, by the way that speaks of Jesus, the same one that Romans chapter 5 is talking about. For by Him were all things created. Question again, re reminding you is, why am I here? By Him, by Jesus, all things were created. That are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by Him and for Him. If you find yourself struggling this morning, you might understand the struggle this way, or you, you probably...
we're doing anything good. We're accomplishing anything good. I mean, we get up, we do our daily chores, whatever that happens to be. We come home, we lay down, we sleep, we get up, we do the same thing, and we get into that over and over and over, and we think, Man, is this really what it's all about? Is this all there is to life? Is this all I have to look forward to for the rest of my life? I mean, we, we find ourselves lacking joy. I understand something. Because we don't Uh, having difficulty with people because we don't have purpose. So let's talk for just a moment about what our primary root main purpose is for even existence, right? We were created by Him and for Him. God has a purpose for you. He created you for a reason. And let me just open your mind to this thought this morning. What is it? Why did he create you? And by the way, you say, well, I don't like my hair. I don't like my hands. I don't like my feet. I don't like my face. I don't like my body. I don't like this. I don't like that. A lot of people are like that. They change their hair color, paint their face all up, tattoo their body, do all kinds of stuff, trying to change, Right? A lot of that is because we don't understand our purpose. If we understood why God created me thus, we'd be more satisfied and have joy in God in how we were created and for what we were created. As a young man, I was really sensing that. Why am I here? What is my purpose I try to do this, and I can't make headway, and people fight with me, and I can't get through anywhere. I can't accomplish anything. What's the purpose? And then Jesus came and showed me my purpose. I'm going back to the book of Revelation, chapter 4, last book in the New Testament, last book in your Bible, chapter number 4, verse number 11. Just show you a quick thought here. Revelation chapter 4, verse number 11. It says, Thou art worthy, O Lord. It's talking about Jesus again. He is the Lord. Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power. For thou hast created all things. So understand this. Jesus created all of us. He created you. He created me. He created everything that is. As the creator of something, he's the owner of it, and he gets to decide what it's for. That's the way it works. Notice what it says in the last part of that verse. And for thy what? Pleasure. They are... And were created. In other words, go all the way back to the beginning of time. Go back to the beginning of creation. Why did God say, let there be a light? Why did God say, okay, let's create some fish. Let's create some animals. Let's create some birds. Let's create some humans. A lot of times people get in trouble because they say, well, uh, God would want me to be happy. Well, I'll say this. God doesn't necessarily want you to be sad. But the problem is, and where we get in trouble is, we try to find joy the way we want to find joy without understanding the concept that we were created for a purpose. That it's not I did not create. So there is a And as soon as we unlock some things for us, including this joy, God's purpose in creating man, according to the Bible, was so 
that he could have joy. It was for his pleasure. He wanted fellowship. He wanted companionship. We know about that because we like having friends. You get to be a young lad and, and you think, I think I might. Could. Up to that point, you think, girls, ah. But then all of a sudden, something happens and you go, girls. Right? Isn't that how it happens? And up to that point, girls are going, boys, ah. Eh. But then some, at some point, they go, boy. Why? Because we were created by God, and we desire companionship. And after boy meets girl, it's, they're just googly-eyed, and they don't know any, they're up from their down, they're in from their out, what time of day it is, what's going on. They just lose. Say, so how do you know? Duh. I'm old enough to know, okay? I've experienced, been there, done that. But understand, that's not why he created us. That relationship, by the way, is a picture of the God-person relationship. And I don't have time to get into all that this morning, but just understand that God allows us to have the marriage relationship, and it simulates and it helps us visually on the earth physically see the relationship between us and Him. And that relationship brings joy. So does the God-created relationship. Okay? God's purpose for creating man was to have joy in fellowship with man. And he intended for us to have a close and personal relationship with him. And if you go back to Genesis chapter 1, 2, and 3, you find out how he set that up and how he was going about it. And he was providing everything, he was doing everything until they said, well, we're going to try something else. God wants a best friend. Isn't it nice to have a best friend? How does it, how does it feel when a best friend isn't, doesn't act like a best friend anymore? Hurts, doesn't it? We, we, we might get to that place where we think, nobody loves me. If I wasn't here, nobody would care. Because that broken relationship causes those emotions. It causes that hurt. It causes that to happen. And understand something. The joy that we're needing can be restored by a change that results in an exchange that Jesus is responsible for. So yes, we're created for God's pleasure. However, let me, let me quote to you a, a passage in Isaiah chapter 61. Verse 10 says, I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall be joyful in my God. For he hath clothed me, clothed me with gar, the garment of salvation. He hath covered me with the robe of righteousness as a bridegroom decketh himself with ornaments, and as a bride adorneth herself with her jewels. Remember, I said the, the, the boy-girl, the husband-wife relationship mimics and, and, and gives us a visual for the us-God relationships, and, and Isaiah very clearly plays that and helps us to see that, right? And, and Isaiah is saying, my joy, my sincere joy comes in that relationship just like the man meets the woman at the altar and man, they are so excited. We, God has pleasure in relationship and we have pleasure in relationship psalm 43 4 says then will i go unto the altar of god unto god my exceeding joy he writes yea upon the harp i will praise thee O god my god psalm 32 10 and 11 
Many sorrows shall be to the wicked, but to he that trusteth in the Lord, mercy shall compass him about. Mercy shall compass him about. Verse 11, be glad in the Lord. Rejoice, ye righteous, and shout for joy, all ye that are upright in heart. When we have a right relationship, a, a corrected, a restored, a reconciled relationship with God, there is intense and wonderful joy that's there. Philippians 4.4 4 in the New Testament says, Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. And I wish I had time to, to go back and really study those out with you and all those verses, and by the way, many more. But I don't have time for that this morning. I just want you to understand that oftentimes we don't have joy because we have this broken, unreconciled relationship with God who is our Creator, and He made us to have that, and we're not having it. Therefore, we cannot have joy. We try to relate... Uh, Chain, we try to get it, the joy with uh, human relationships. And then boy meets girl, they get married, think, oh, she is the best thing, he is the best thing that ever came on planet Earth. But God is not in the relationship. And so very shortly, the relationship is broken, and they find out, I hate you, I can't stand you, I wish you were dead, I wish I never met you. And all such things start coming out. Can you, can you relate? Because our joy cannot be found apart from the one who reconciled and the one who brings about our atonement. Because the real problem is not the human relationship. That's a reflection of the God relationship. And when the God relationship is broken, friends, all the rest of them are broken as well. They're all corrupted. They'll never work out. You can find the greatest job on the planet. You can go to the greatest church on the planet. And guess what? You'll find misery there. Unless your heart's right with God, unless you've met with Jesus and he's reconciled, he's changed you and exchanged with you, you'll never have joy. You can't have joy. It's impossible to have joy because joy is tied up in this thing. We, have, we also have joy in God through our Lord Jesus Christ. That's what it says. In the book of Romans again. You should probably stuck your finger in there because that's what I suggest that you do. And you always do what I suggest, so I'm sure you must have. Romans chapter 3, verse 23. Notice what it says. For all have what? And come short of what? The glory of God. You see, here's the problem. There, right there, is the problem. And that's why we can't get to joy. Because we haven't been reconciled. We've all sinned, and we've fallen short. We, we've, we've missed out on the glory of God what, God, what God created us for. The purpose in which we were created, we are now, it, it's impossible. We can't do that. Our relationship with God has been broken and it can only be reconciled. It can only be made right again through Jesus Christ and His change and exchange. Because we've fallen short of God's expectations, it is impossible for us to please Him. It's impossible for us to glorify Him, which is what we were created to do. It's like we're a train sitting in the middle of a pasture field. You ever seen a train chugging through the pasture field? It don't work, does it? In order for a train to chug anywhere, it has to be on tracks. It has to be on the place and in the place that it was created to operate in. If it's anywhere else on the freeway, put it on the ocean. Put that train anywhere but the tracks, and it's not going anywhere. You can chug that box full of coal and get that thing steamed up and to where it's blowing black smoke and its wheels are spinning like crazy, and it's not going an inch. Because it's not where it was intended to be. 
Friends, I'm here to tell you this morning that we find ourselves without joy, find ourselves frustrated, aggravated, annoyed at life because we just don't feel like we're making any forward motion, and it's because of the very fact that we are not where we are supposed to be in our relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. He is our reconciler. He is our atoner. And until we deal with him, there is nothing else. You can look in all the bottles. You can all look in all the pill bottles, all the alcohol bottles. You can look in all the card games and all the bars and all the happy joints that are out there. You can go to every church service on the face of the planet, and you will never find joy until there's an exchange with Jesus. And I also want you to remember another thing. After that change and exchange happens, you think, well, I got it. Now I'm good. I'm, I'm good for the rest of my life. Well, it, you have an eternal home. God has fixed the eternal problem. But if you continue in sin, you will be the most unhappy, saved person on the face of the planet. Because as long as we are living apart from the plan and purpose of God, we will not be joyous. We will not have happiness, even if our salvation is saved. By the way, the person says, I'm saved, but I don't care about living for God, I question. And again, I realize I'm just a human being, and I'm not a very good judge, but you didn't understand what salvation was about. Because salvation buys you with a price. You're bought out of the slave market of sin. You, it, yes, you're going to fall again. Yes, you're going to sin again. 1 John 1, 8 uh, and 9, chapter 2, verses 1 and 2. But here's the thing. If God saves a person, he takes ownership of that person, and they start doing what he wants them to do. And if it doesn't happen that way, something is terribly wrong. The children of Israel had great joy headed into the promised land. But when they forgot God and they didn't bring God glory and they weren't concerned about God, His, His, uh, His directions, uh, meeting with God, understanding the things of God, when they didn't sit down every day with their kids and recite the things of God, when they didn't talk about it when they got up and when they sat down and by the wayside, they lost their joy. And they ended up back in captivity. And he had to rescue them again. And how did he rescue them again, you say? <laughs> Reconciliation. It's in the same thing happens to Christians who stop living for Jesus. They lose their joy. Even if they don't lose their their, their heritage, they don't lose their parentage, they don't, lose, uh, they don't stop being adopted by God, but they certainly stop being happy. And they need to repent. For that to happen, someone must admit that they were wrong and that they failed and that they left the relationship. That somehow they let the other party down. And you know, with humans, it's possible that both parties did something wrong, right? But with God, guess what? There's only one party that did anything wrong, and it wasn't Him. If there's any repenting going on, it's definitely our, on our uh, plate to get done. I want to point you to a passage back in 1 Kings. 1 Kings, it's way back there with all the firsts and seconds. And uh, if you get to, of course, if you get to Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, if you get to Judges, you went too far. Uh, 1 Samuel, 2 Samuel, uh, you're, you're getting close. It's in 1 Kings chapter 8 is where I want to direct your attention to. Listen, the good news for you this morning is, it, is that there is an opportunity in Jesus Christ for reconciliation because He died. 
And we can be saved by his life. And not only so, but we can have joy in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom we have now received the atonement. Once that atonement has been done, there can be joy. Once that change and exchange has taken place, there can be joy. But again, we can continue to disappoint. We can continue wrongly thinking that it's all right to continue in sin, that grace may abound. And Paul writes, God forbid, how can we, how could we? that are dead to, dead to sin live any longer therein. First uh, Kings chapter number 8 with me. Uh, you're in verse four, uh, 46, rather. Verse 46, chapter 8 and verse number 46. And I want you to show, show you something here. That I, I expect and I believe can give you some hope. In verse 46 of First Kings chapter 8, it says, If they sin against thee, for there is no man that sinneth not. See how I put that in there? And thou be angry with them. He's talking about God. He's talking to God. Deliver them to the enemy. Wow. If you're angry with your kids and you deliver them to the enemy so that they carry them away captive unto the land of the enemy, far or near. Verse 47 if they bethink themselves in the land whither they were carried captive, and notice this word, repent. They have a change of mind, a change of heart. That's, that's this thing that we see up here. It says reconciled. That's the activity, reconciled. We get to that by repentance, by turning around in our heart and in our head, and make supplication unto thee. In other words, they ask, uh, unto thee in the land of them that carried them captives, saying, We have sinned. We have done perversely. We have committed wickedness. Verse 48, so, And so return unto thee with all their heart and with all their soul in the land of their enemies, which led them away captive, and pray unto thee toward their land, which thou gavest unto their fathers, the city which thou hast chosen, and the house which I have built for thy name. It says in verse 49, Then hear thou their prayer and their supplication in heaven, thy dwelling place, and maintain their cause. They're your children. They got wrong. They got captive because you got upset with them and let the captives take them away. Now they're in a faraway place, and over there they wake up and realize, you know what, why am I here? Well, because I sinned. I'm here because I abandoned God. God didn't abandon me. I abandoned Him. And now I am over here in this captive land, and He says they turn around, they repent, they cry out, they call upon you, and you'll hear their prayer, their supplication in heaven. You'll maintain their cause. Verse 50, And forgive thy people that have sinned against thee, and all their transgressions wherein they have transgressed against thee, and give them compassion. Before them who carried them captive, that they may have compassion on them. I want you to see something, friends. We find ourselves captives. Say, well, we're not in another land. No. We're captivated by our sin, we're captivated by our culture. Captivated by wrong thinking, wrong ideas, wrong desires, we're, the lusts of the flesh and everything else that goes, we're captivated. And he says, if we'll repent, he'll hear, he'll take up our cause, and he'll restore us. That's for those that have been saved, that know their, he says, you might be in captivity. You might find yourself somewhere you never thought you'd be. But it's because you didn't care about the things of God. And when he saved you, you continued playing around with sin. 
Now you find yourselves captives. By the way, if you're saved this morning and you're playing around with sin, that's where you're headed. And one day you'll look up and say, how did I get here? Just understand it wasn't God that got you there. He allowed you to go there in spite of the fact that he loves you, cares about you, and, and, and even saved you. But we, we get into sin because that's what I, our flesh wants to do. And you need to repent. Get your heart right with God. Ask him to forgive you. Cry out to him. And he'll give you compassion from your captors. So that you can recover yourself and find joy. Because Jesus reconciled. And we can receive the atonement, the exchange. If you're here, you've never accepted Christ as your Savior. You've never called on Him for salvation. All of these things are foreign and strange to you. Understand something. God loves you. You think, well, I don't know anything about Him, but He loves you. And that's why you're here, because He loves you. He's reached out to you and said, hey, you need to go to Heartland Baptist Church this morning and hear this message I'm having preach. It took me all week to to dig this out of here. And last night and again this morning, I said, God, I don't know who's coming this morning. They might all gone on. They might be out, you know, surely you're not out there chasing the deals at the yard sales because they all got wet. It's all free stuff now, by the way. I don't know who's going to show up, God, but whoever it is, I need something that will help them. Some of you are captive, captivated by sin. Jesus died to set you free. He died to reconcile you to God. Believer, you might this morning wake up and find yourself in a position and think, man, I don't think I'd, I, I never thought that I'd be where I'm at. Never thought I'd be engaged and in, in involved in things I'm involved in. And, and get here. You got here by following your flesh, by following your sin nature, by not listening to God, by not understanding that you're a train that He put on a track to go one direction to God. Maybe you're here lacking joy this morning. Would you consider repenting? Maybe you're here lost this morning. Would you consider turning to Christ? He died to bring us back to God. His death pays and paves the way for us to be restored. You know, in Luke chapter 15, there's a story of the prodigal son. He said, Dad, give me what's mine, and I'm leaving. He took off, and he went to a foreign country, and he spent everything his dad gave him on things his dad never would have spent a dime on. And after he spent it, all of it, he found himself sitting in a hog pen, eating with the hog. What? The servants of my dad are eating bread. I'm sorry, please forgive me. The Bible says that dad opened his arms, put them around him, gave him clean clothes, gave him nice shoes, put a ring back on his finger, killed the calf, and said, let's, let's celebrate. My son that was lost is now found. Reconciled, atoned. That's what Jesus did. All so that we could have joy. But you'll never have joy outside of that relationship with God. 
Let's stand together this morning. You can have joy in your life, but not apart from God. You'll never have it. It's not available. Father, I want to thank you for the day. Thank you for these that have gathered. And Father, even right now, I pray that you'd help us to realize that you didn't leave us. You didn't depart us. You haven't forsaken us. Father, we have left. We have forsaken. We've abandoned you. We've turned our back on you and, and, and what you desired and why we were created. Father, we're feeling lonely. We're feeling scared. We're afraid. We don't know which way to turn. We're captive. We're, we're lost. But Jesus died to reconcile us and to exchange burdens with us and invite us to come through him back to you. Lord, I pray that you'd help us this morning. If there's anyone in this room that's feeling alone, that's feeling frightened, that's scared, that's feeling separated from you, that has no joy. Father, I, I've done all I can do, and now it is up entirely to you and them. And I pray that during this invitation time, they would be able to work that out with you. They'd be able to come back knowing that you as a heavenly father would throw his arms open and accept them and forgive them and grant them uh, the, the reconciliation that Jesus uh, did for them and exchanged burdens with them. Father, I pray that you'd help now and you'd do the work that only you can do. And it's in Jesus' name that I ask.